Once again, welcome everyone uh, to Exempt Wells and Land Use. Um, kind of a complicated topic, but we feel like it's one that's um, pretty important. I know we have several members that are on here tonight, and um, I did just do sort of an article, an article about this in our latest Down to Earth, which came in my mailbox yesterday. Did everyone else get their Down to Earth? Um, and you've read it cover to cover already, I assume. Yeah, everybody say yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a topic that I we really want to cover because we feel like it's kind of critical in the way that water policy is driving land use. So I am Ann Schwend. I'm the Sustainable Communities Policy Director for MEIC. And we are really fortunate tonight to have Andrew Gorder with the Clark Fork Coalition joining us. Andrew, do you wanna go ahead and, and introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background? Sure, um, yeah, thanks um, to okay. Anne and Katie and everyone at MEIC for inviting me um, to talk about this subject, which I um, I guess I enjoy talking about, even though it's a thorn in our institutional side at the Clark Fork Coalition that has been for a long time. But um, I'm Andrew Gorder. I'm an attorney with the Clark Fork Coalition. I've been with um, the coalition since uh, 2017. And um, my background is in water law and water policy. Before I worked um, at the Clark Fork Coalition, I um, did a number of, of things, sort of general water practice or water law practice, um, but worked at the Montana Water Court for a number of years doing adjudication work and kind of general um, environmental um, nonprofit advocacy and conservation work prior to that. Um, so was kind of well prepared to come uh, back to Missoula, where I got my my law degree and um, and work with the Clark Fork Coalition on uh, a number of, of water related issues, obviously, um, advocacy and policy work, but also water rights work and in stream flow um, changes and all of that. So that's kind of my background. And um, I've in my time at CFC, I've gotten well um, well steeped in exempt wells um, and and uh, definitely um, this is an issue that is both sort of comes up uh, quite regularly at the legislature um, and um, we've we've fought off a number of bad attempts to to make the situation worse the last few legislative sessions but it's also a timely discussion right now um, and we'll get to that a little later but thanks again for having me all right thanks Andrew um, yeah, this is a this is a topic that has been an ongoing problem in Montana for a number of years. Um, Andrew said he's been working on it for quite a while. I have been paying attention and following uh, the exempt well issue for probably 25 years. I think it's about that long. And it is something that I love to talk about. But what we're going to try to do this evening is make it a little bit more pertinent and a little bit more casual. We have a lot of information to give you, but we want folks to feel free to um, put questions in the chat uh, as we're going along, and we'll see if we can just make this a little bit more conversational. Um, Katie, do you wanna go ahead and get started uh, or load that up? So this is a piece that we have from um, Headwaters Economics, and I couldn't load it into the slideshow, but it's from their website. And it's depicting um, how much land use has changed in single family homes over the last, um, I believe it's 20 years. <clears throat> no, sorry, it's since 1900. And you can see the red dots showing up. And it's not that single family homes are bad, but it is an indication of the kind of growth and development that we're seeing. And we want to be able to really demonstrate how this single family home use and exempt wells are really changing the landscape and open space in Montana. Thanks, Katie. I think we can go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so some really interesting facts from this report that Headwaters did and released in 2018. And in speaking with Patty Hernandez, yesterday from Headwaters Economics, 
she has, uh, they have new data that they have come up with since 2018, but they're not quite ready to release that. But surprisingly, seeing that 25% of all homes in Montana have been constructed since 2000. So we know that Montana is growing pretty rapidly. Um, and there are a lot of single family homes that are being built. But one of the other pieces of that that we that lots of people aren't talking about is that most of those homes, nearly half of them, have been built on lot sizes that are exceeding 10 acres. And 60% of all of these homes are constructed outside of incorporated areas, um, almost certainly on permit exempt wells, because that's how you, that's what your water source oh. is when you are outside of a municipal or public water system. Okay, Katie. Next. There we go. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, so I mean, this this slide just kind of illustrates um, that point. And I guess one of the takeaways that, that Ann and I hope to impart here is that the exempt well policy, the existing exempt well policies uh, that we have in Montana are really driving uh, the types of growth that we're seeing and the locations of that growth uh, statewide. So if you look at, you know, the data from Montana DNRC on just the number of exempt wells being drilled each year uh, in Montana, this is just the last 10 years, but you can see that that sort of uh, illustrates the point here, uh, as we see this, this growth um, in, and development statewide, we see the number of exempt wells uh, being drilled remain fairly steady. So it's it's over the last 25 years, it's been uh, anywhere from 1,500 to 4,500 exempt wells per year, but pretty steadily averaging about um, 2,600 uh, exempt wells uh, every year uh, being drilled across the state in both uh, open basins and and closed basins, so basins that are closed to new getting a new water right or new permit. So, um, but yeah, I mean that's that's kind of just the uh, different way to illustrate uh, the problem that we'll we'll hope to uh, detail here today. Um, and then if you want to go to the next slide, I mean, oh, is this the Anne? What yeah. you had just. Uh, <laughs> added here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I just um so one of the things that's pretty interesting about this is Andrew and I have both been trying to like nail down a number of exactly how many exempt wells do we have in the state and you know getting kind of trying to get our arms wrapped around that. And there are different types of exempt wells and we are going to get right and we're going to get into that in just a minute what we mean by an exempt well. Um, we're just trying to sort of lay the groundwork for this first. But the truth is, it's really difficult to figure out exactly how many we have. So I went to the DNRC's water right um, query website just a little while ago, and they have this great new feature where you could map it. And the little blue dots that are on this map are indicating new wells um, that have been put in place since January 1st, 2013 until today. And I think it's just a great depiction of how these fast growing counties, um, that that's where we're seeing a lot of this, of these kinds of wells going in. Next slide, Kenny. So what do we mean by exempt well and why, why does that matter? And you know, how do we really define this? Next slide. But I have to, before we get into it, um, I have to just quickly go over sort of water right basics, because it's important to understand when we say exempt well. And water right basics in Montana, all of the water in the state of the Montana is in the state is a public resource. It's a property of the state. And people that are using water have to get a permit in most cases to use that water. And what happened was when the state was being settled, people were, settlers were coming in and they said, we want to irrigate this field or we're going to use it for mining or we need it for our home. And they just started putting water to use. And when they did that, then they would go into the county courthouse and they would file. Our system is known as the prior appropriation system, but it's basically a priority system. So whoever got here first 
has the oldest rights. And the oldest rights in the state are, you know, somewhere around um, late 1850s, early 60s. Uh, in most agricultural circles, if your water right is newer than 1900, you may call that a senior water right, but I know just a couple of years ago in the Ruby Basin, um, water was so short that if your water was a 1901 right, you weren't getting water that year from a surface water right. So that system is set up for permitting and DNRC, Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, is who administers water rights. So when you wanna get a new water right, you have to go to DNRC and you ask them and you fill out a form and they analyze it and they determine if that water right is gonna have an impact on any other existing water users, um, particularly surface water and groundwater. So the overarching piece of it is called no adverse effect. Your water right cannot have an adverse effect on anyone else who has a water right that's junior. That means anything that's come before you. Several parts of the state, DNRC and the legislature recognize that there are several places where there are more water rights. They have granted more water right permits than there is legally water available. And so they have closed those new, they have closed those basins to any new water rights. Um, because they're over-appropriated. <clears throat> over One last piece that I don't have on here is that in Montana, we recognize um, that groundwater and surface water are one resource. So if somebody is applying for a surface water right from a stream, they have to, DNRC has to analyze, is that going to impact the stream and the groundwater? Or if you're applying for a groundwater right, it can't have an impact on the surface water. <clears throat> Go ahead, Katie. And then we'll let Andrew get into the details on exempt wells. Yeah, so so what is an exempt well? So, you know, as Ann just pointed out, we have this kind of hodgepodge system for acquiring water rights in Montana um, that, was, that was fairly loose. But that all ended in 1973 when the state uh, passed the Montana Water Use Act. And after 1973, if you want to use water, you need to get a permit. Um, but there were exemptions, ex exceptions to that uh, that requirement to get a permit. And so when we talk about exempt wells, uh, that's one of the exceptions. And uh, the reason why there was an exception drawn for these wells is it was really to allow for sort of rural dispersed uh, water users to acquire a, a small well without having to go through uh, the sort of rigorous um, and sometimes expensive process of acquiring a, a, a water permit. Um, and and that seemed fairly reasonable uh, at the time. And so they, they, they define that, or at least it's defined now, um, as a as a well that pumps uh, less than 35 gallons per minute for a flow rate and no more than 10 acre feet of water per year. Um, and, and that's a that's not a, a you know that's not a, a small amount of water per se, uh, but but generally speaking, because these are for domestic uses, um, household use is is, is generally uh, non-consumptive or or largely non-consumptive, meaning, uh, your domestic water use in your house, uh, a lot of that water is not being consumed and it ultimately returns back to uh, the aquifer. That being said, um, exempt wells, you know, domestic use for under an exempt well can encompass uh, lawn and garden irrigation uh, as well. And so, um, as, as we all know, uh, in the peak growing season or in the summer, um, that can that can be a, a, a significant use of water, um, and and it can be fairly consumptive as well. Um, so that's really um, that's what an exempt well is. It's exempt from the permitting requirements of the Montana Water Use Act, um, and and that's been the the state of affairs for uh, for quite a while in Montana. And I'll get in now to kind of. Um, you know the original intention, and then uh, on the next slide, we'll we'll look at 
uh, what has happened or how that um, how that exemption is kind of played out on the ground. Andrew, before we go on, um, well, it's fine if we're there on this slide, but um, consumptive use, um, you know, I, sorry, we sometimes use terms that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but consumptive use means water that is no longer available in the system. So you think about plants, plants are using that water and it's not available for anyone else, but water that's coming from your household is just going right through down the drain and into your septic system and it's polluted, but it is not consumed in uh, terms of water policy um, procedures. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Yeah, sorry if we throw out, um, if I'm throwing out terms that are <clears throat> um, kind of water nerd terminology, uh, <laughs> please jump in in the chat and, and slow me down at any point. Um, so again, yeah, we, we started off with this kind of narrow exemption for for small wells in rural areas um, to be to be drilled without a, getting a permit, and what happened after that? <clears throat> well, as we start to see, um, you know, the the growth uh, sort of trajectory take off in Montana, uh, we we saw that this e exemption started to get uh, abused, um, and and honestly, uh, the way things ex exist now. Um, it's really become a, a default mechanism for development, uh, particularly in basins that are closed, to getting a new permit. Um, so this has become a primary tool uh, for, for subdividing land um, and acquiring the water needed to support the development that's going to occur on that land. Um, and obviously, that's problematic because uh, when you have an exempt well, it's exempt from all those permitting requirements. So there's no analysis of what those what that water use is going to mean for both existing water users who are in the area. Um, there's no analysis of if it's that use is going to deplete um, the aquifer, uh, no analysis of whether that's going to impact an existing water user or stream flows. And really, the problem becomes not just the individual wells, but the cumulative impacts of multiple exempt wells that are all drawing from the same aquifer. Um, and then there are process problems um, as well. I mean, a, the, a water a water right in Montana is a property right, um, and you're, you're afforded due process of law if someone's going to impact your property right. Uh, but with an exempt well, there's no notification to other water users um, that there's going to be a new water use that could impact their existing water rights. Um, there's no opportunity for uh, uh, those users to object um, as they would with a normal permit. Um, and then the other problem here is that, as Ann mentioned before, we don't really know how much water is being used by all of the exempt wells um, statewide because we don't have, there's no monitoring or measuring or any kind of reporting requirement. Um, for the use of those wells. Um, so that makes it uh, really difficult for anyone to really know how their existing water rights are being impacted, um, let alone, you know, try to enforce the priority of their water right if it is senior. Um, it just, it, it creates a whole lot of problems um, and we're seeing some of those um, play out on the ground right now. I saw a note from from Kim Wilson in the chat there, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, yeah. yeah, and then uh, the other big impact here is is changes to land use, and I think that's the next thing that Anne's going to talk about here. Yeah. So I think, and I'm just going to go ahead and reiterate it because Andrew said it, but the problem is that in these closed basins, if you're a developer, you can't get a water right for putting in a public system. So they have to, they basically are sort of forced to go to using these exempt wells. And they, you know, besides the water issue and whether that water, whether the wells are consumptive or not, because of having exempt wells, they often go hand in hand with septic systems, with private septic systems. and. DEQ and the Sanitation Act has laws um, that say you have to have separation between your own well and your septic system and your neighbor's well and your septic system, which is really good 
I mean, we want to use, we want, we want to have that happen because you don't want to be drinking your neighbor's poop basically, or whatever is going down their septic system. But what happens is then it requires that all of these lots that are outside of the city and away from municipal and public systems have to be much larger, uh, requiring more roads and more pavement and more disturbance and basically consuming large amounts of land as uh, we saw in the little piece from Headwaters Economics and how much land is being consumed from this kind of development. So it's this water policy is driving that. It's also allowing development to occur in a lot of places where maybe we don't really want to see development, such as in the wildland urban interface or in floodplains. Um, folks that buy a parcel of land can put a house that might be very closely uh, close to a stream side, and they are allowed to do that and use a well and a septic as long as the septic system is out of the floodplain. And it's also sort of fragmenting habitat. You think about what that's doing to the landscape um, by having all of these homes that are sprawling away and out from the city. It also is converting productive ag land. And Andrew just said it, and we'll say it again in the next slide. And what that means is there's a change in the system, not only from having that productive ag land nearby, um, but also the way that that land was being managed when it goes from being an irrigated field to a subdivision. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, so I'll dive in a little deeper on the on the the water resource impacts of exempt wells and sort of the proliferation of exempt wells um, through development. Um, you know, and and hit the nail on the head there when we're taking land and a lot of times it is uh, formerly um, irrigated ag land um, and driving development out into those rural areas because that's the easiest way uh, for developers to get water um, there's going to be water there's going to be land use impacts but there's going to be water use impacts um, as well because when you take that land out of production um, you're changing the hydrology of the system um, there's changes to uh, from from ditch seepage that used to occur that is no longer there there's changes in uh, return flows so water that used to uh, be used to irrigate um, a field and run off and end up uh, back in the streams or back in the aquifer, that's no longer there. Um, and, and it changes aquifer recharge. You know, we just um, heard some interesting data from DNRC um, about the, the aquifer recharge in the for the Bitterroot aquifer. 39% um, of that is driven by ditch loss. And so if we take land out of production um, and those ditches no longer run, uh, we, we've we lost the, the major contributing factor to aquifer recharge. Um, and so um, there, you know, there's that sort of land use uh, and water use connected impact, um, but it also just it changes our ability for that land to act as a sponge and capture uh, things like snow melt or uh, if we're if we're looking at wetlands, uh, it changes our ability to uh, attenuate floods, um, and so there's there's a whole bunch of sort of spiraling impacts that that come from that change um, in land use that relate to to water, um, and then obviously there are impacts to uh, water quantity as well. If you're if you're tapping a hundred new straws into the aquifer, um, there's very likely to be impacts to both groundwater. Uh, and surface waters that rely on that groundwater. Um, but we're not, the DNRC is not analyzing those impacts at all when it comes to exempt wells. And that's really the problem. Um, and if you're a water user, again, the DNRC is not examining any, um, any potential for adverse effect to your water rights um, as a senior water user. Um, and then the last thing I'll touch on here is, is impacts to water quality. So, um, by and large, every every home that's put in outside of an incorporated area with an exempt well comes with a septic system as well. Um, and under Montana law, you put a septic system in, um, and there's really you 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 put it in for your home, and your re your requirements, your obligations sort of end there. There's no requirement for you to 
to do any sort of maintenance or monitoring to, and those systems tend to break down um, and, and leak. And then, um, you know, that, that uh, leads to all kinds of water quality impacts to, um, to groundwaters and surface waters. And really that means that the water quality impacts from these developments that are relying on exempt wells are externalized. They're pushed off onto somebody else to deal with, um, you know, and the downstream user, a lot of times it's municipalities have to pay to, to treat the water um, once, once it's full of nutrients or um, impacted in another way um, as a result of these developments. So um, yeah, there's, there's a host of both water quantity and quality impacts um, that we're left to deal with um, as a result of these exempt wells. Um, and then I think uh, the, the other important part here is uh, the discussion of water security. Anne, you want to touch on that? Yeah, I think I think the thing that is that strikes me the most is that because of the exception in the permitting system, go ahead, Katie, we can just go to the next slide. Um, because DNRC is not analyzing the impacts of allowing all of these wells to go in. And because development is occurring on these individual wells, I see there's this real problem that people, people are investing in their homes, they're buying land, and they're building their dream home somewhere out in the country. And they believe that putting in a well and doing their septic system, um, that it's going to assure that they have water all the time. But the truth is without having a, well, even if you do have a valid water right permit, you there's no question that uh, water is gonna become more scarce. But these wells are often put in sort of shallow aquifers. And if it's um, in a subdivision, there are planning laws don't deny subdivisions based on water availability. That's DNRC's responsibility. But the problem is the DNRC doesn't have statutory authority to be reviewing and analyzing the impacts to the existing water users when that new subdivision is coming in if they're using exempt wells. So there's no guarantee that there is actually water available. And even if it is available right at that moment, that it won't, that the aquifer may not drop and that the people who have these wells will have to drill a new well. And I have concern that people are buying properties, whether it's a lot in a subdivision or you know 20 acres or 40 acres somewhere else, and they believe that someone is paying attention and will assure that they have water. And it simply is not true um, with the way that our system is set up right now. There are no stop gaps that say, you are always gonna have water. And I just feel like that's uh, a train wreck just looking for a place to happen. Anything else you want to add to that, Andrew? No, I think that that's that's spot on. I mean, it because this is we're relying on so much um, so much development or so much of the development that we're seeing is uh, relying on exempt wells. What what those individuals and those homes are acquiring is not a water right in the sense that uh, we we traditionally think of them in Montana. They're getting a piece of paper that says, you know, they're allowed to pump this much water, not to exceed 10 acre feet um, per year, but it's really not enforceable in any other meaningful way. And so it's it is alarming. Um, and I think that's uh, a, an incentive, at least one of the incentives for really trying to make some large scale policy changes in how we treat exempt wells and groundwater appropriations. Um, in Montana um, to protect uh, the, the folks that are moving here, right? The, the folks that are investing in these properties and, um, and, and buying homes. And so, yeah, it's, it's a super important part uh, uh, of the issue. Right. You think about, um, and I'm going to go back just in my mind to that picture that was um, earlier on where you had the permitted field and then you had the subdivision. So let's say that the irrigation that's going on 
next door to, you know, you didn't have to go, oh, well, that's fine. Thanks, Katie. But let's say that that there is um, flood irrigation that's been occurring um, on the permitted property. That flood irrigation, because all the water isn't consumed, is basically saturating that soil profile. And it may be artificially elevating that aquifer. And when that producer decides to sell their land and it gets converted to a subdivision, you no longer have an irrigation water that's being applied to that property. Instead, now you're sticking a whole bunch more straws um, into the property and sucking water out without putting any of it back in. Um, and so that's what we mean by changing that hydrology and that security. So the people that are in that first subdivision not only uh, don't have any, re they really basically don't have any recourse to say you can't approve that subdivision because there isn't enough water because um, they're not really required to do an analysis. DNRC is not required to look at what was happening on the other property, if that makes sense. I may have made it more complicated. Anyway, um, do we have questions from anybody now before we have our last little bit is sort of some of the recommendations that we have, um, recommendations and options. Okay, let's go ahead and get into that then. So I'll jump in first. And I, the reason why um, I think this, this topic is timely is because I feel like we're sort of at a tipping point in Montana where um, all of the interested parties, be it uh, representatives of, of the development industry, um, our state agencies like DNRC, uh, um, agricultural interests, conservation interests. I think everybody recognizes that this current situation is untenable. Something needs to change here with exempt wells. And the DNRC has actually put together, uh, after the last legislative session, they put together a working group that that's sort of, sort of meant to represent a diverse uh, uh, group of stakeholders on this issue and try to work on policy revisions. And so um, I think it's it's worth discussing what some of the recommendations are to, to deal with this problem um, and, and sort of what the other options are on the table. And, um, you know, the first one that jumps to mind for me is we're, we're talking about it, an exception to the permitting system um, and all of the problems that come from that uh, exemption. And I think the reality of the situation is if there's an exemption to the permitting process, regardless of how narrow you make that exemption, people are going to go lower and lower to try to get under that bar. You know, it's just it's just the reality, uh, uh, I think, of the situation. Um, so let's require a permit. Let's just get everybody on a permitting system. It doesn't have to, uh, we, we can make uh, changes to what that permitting process looks like to try to save people time and money um, and, and make it as, sort of painless as possible. But if we have an exemption to the permitting process that is driving all of these myriad different issues um, that are being externalized to other water users or just general uh, Montanans to kind of uh, to deal with, uh, let's require a permit. Um, and so that's one option. The other option would be uh, mitigate their use. So if you're going to put in devel a development that is relying on exempt wells, uh, whether it's 10 wells, 20 wells, 40 wells, um, let's require you to mitigate that use, uh, at least in, in basins that are closed to new appropriations, because that's what everybody else has to do if you want to get a permit. Um, so you you what that means is you have to offset your new proposed use in some form or fashion so that the net depletion of water is remains static or the status quo kind of remains um, remains in place. And, and uh, a lot of times that means uh, purchasing an existing water right and retiring that water right to offset your new proposed use. Yes, that's more expensive um, as a developer, um, but that might be, um, that might be a, a change that's just required in order to protect our water resources and existing water users. Sorry, I'm looking at the question here. 
I think we can get to that in just a minute. It's a great question, though, Danny, but not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and then, uh, Anne, do you want to touch on some of these other options here? Sure, right. So requiring, measuring, and monitoring, I mean, that's what we should be doing with all of our water rights. Um, you know, there should be sort of a reporting system so that we actually have an accounting of how much water everyone is using. And that's not just exempt wells, but that's, um, you know, hopefully down the road as we finish up adjudication, we'll be doing that with all of the existing water rights. Um, certainly public systems make the most sense, um, you know, getting, thinking about developments as communities and putting all of those homes on systems so it doesn't require such large lots. Um, is ideal or getting them to annex into municipal and public water supplies that are already existing if they're close to a larger city. Um, but another, you know, another thing is thinking about small, really small systems that maybe are in more remote areas. Um, and there was a bill this last session that uh, John Fitzpatrick, who's out of Anaconda, brought forward that was basically, he was asking, he was saying, if I put in a smaller system, if I build the system and put that in place before the lots are sold, can I be assured of having that water right? Water right? Will we recognize it as a beneficial use? Can I know that we will have at least 10 acre feet you know, for that system? And then all of the homes share that. And you know, it seems like that's a pretty, that's a reasonable way to go um, for a way for us to start. And especially if we're thinking about monitoring down the road and what that looks like. And it allows for development to not be quite so large. Even if we're not doing just the small systems or thinking about the public systems, um, one thing that dawns on me, you know, we heard a lot this last legislative session about affordable housing and there were many people that were standing up, developers in particular, and saying, we need to be able to um, build lots more homes, and we need to do that so that it's affordable. But the part that they weren't mentioning was that it was affordable for them to build out in the county where they don't quite, where they don't have as many restrictions, but where they also don't have to put these systems in. And I would love for us to begin to say, when there is a development going in, that that is part of the development, that the developer has to build the infrastructure for the water systems. <clears throat> so it's not each individual homeowner has to manage their own, put in their own well, put in their own septic and manage all of that on their own. And then the last item, um, and I'm gonna throw that one back to you, Andrew, to sort of, you know, as we think about, cause that's a question mark, like, if these other ideas aren't moving forward, um, potentially we think about litigation. Yeah, and I, I, um, I, I'll, I'll say as a caveat. Well, well, first I want to get to the the question uh, that popped up in the chat about. Um, I think the question was was uh, whether I was recommending or talking about a change to the Montana Subdivision and Platting Act. Um, and really what, what I was contemplating or would contemplate is a change in the Montana Water Use Act. So keep that jurisdiction with the DNRC to, to manage water use in Montana, but um, uh, amend the Water Use Act to deal specifically with this problem of, of sort of abuse of exempt wells by requiring mitigation um, or require that people to get a permit. And that's... And, you know, if you if you're getting a permit, you sort of deal with the mitigation component at the same time. Um, so that's what I was discussing there. Um, but in terms of litigation, Wait, Andrew, before yeah. you go into litigation, I do want to add, um, Danny, that I think it would be really helpful if the Montana Subdivision and Platting Act actually identified water as on its own um, as criteria for um, approving a subdivision. Yes, I'm gonna, I'll answer that one. So it's both because right now we're disconnected between the Water Use Act and the Subdivision and Planning Act. So, yeah, okay, agree, kind of agree, agree 100% there. Um, I think this is, it's interesting 
to see how this plays out on the ground because it's kind of everybody's looking to a different agency to say, oh, well, DNRC's got to they're they're going to address this, right? They're going to make sure that we're we're uh, we have enough groundwater that our use isn't going to impact anyone. Um, if if they're not going to do it, DEQ is going to do it, or the county's going to do it, but nobody's really doing it. <laughs> so um, it's it's just kind of everybody passing the buck right now. Um, but in terms of of litigation, we did get a decision um, from Judge Sherlock. So the Clark Fork Coalition brought. Um, a suit um, that that uh, resulted in a decision in, in 2014. Um, and th that that dealt with part of the problem. Um, what what that decision said was that uh, the DNRC cannot ignore the cumulative impacts of multiple exempt wells being drilled as part of a single project. Um, and that decision was appealed to the Montana Supreme Court and it was upheld. And really what the Montana Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court said in their decision was, if we're going to have an exemption, um, it's the quantity of water that's that's appropriated under that ex exemption matters. So it's not necessarily about the number of wells being drilled or the uh, connection of those wells or how they're put in. It's the quantity of water that's being appropriated. And if it's not a small amount of water, um, it violates the Water Use Act. And so um, after that decision was came down, uh, you know, we didn't really see the number of exempt, we saw some changes, but we didn't really see the total number of exempt wells being drilled statewide uh, decrease in any meaningful amount because these, uh, these develop, or I, I shouldn't lay it all on the, um, Feet of developers, but I think there was new creative ways found to uh, to get developments in relying on exempt wells and still uh, fall under the exemption uh, because that's the easiest way uh, to do things. And in some basins, that's really uh, the only the only option that you you have. Um, but since that time, um, you know there is a there is a case that I think it popped up in the chat earlier. Kim Wilson's got a. Uh, an active case that is really uh, looking at how the DNRC is enforcing the existing law and whether that complies with uh, the the Water Use Act, whether it complies with the Montana Supreme Court's decision in the Clark Fork Coalition case, um, and I think the other the other sort of legal hooks here um, are in the Montana Constitution. So. Uh, the Mo Montana Constitution recognizes uh, prior appropriation um, as uh, the the system that all water use is uh, supposed to be under in the state of Montana, um, and this exemption really uh, uh, flouts that priority system, as Ann mentioned earlier. Uh, we also have a right to a clean and healthful environment. Um, I think there's implications for for that right here. Uh, we have a constitutional right for or it's sort of an affirmative duty for the legislature to prevent the unreasonable unreasonable depletion of our natural resources. Um, and I think uh, in this case, if we don't even know how much groundwater is being uh, depleted uh, statewide via exempt wells, there's at least an argument that uh, that's a violation of the legislature's duty to protect our natural resources. So I think there's a number of legal hooks here that could um, that are sort of already in play and could come into play uh, again if we don't really deal with this problem uh, comprehensively. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, anything to add there? Yeah, no, I think that was that was great. I mean, I think that is the point. It's, you know, basically what we're trying to say is that exempt wells are not following the permitting system. We have we have this system of, of administration set up. Um, but we're not really adhering to it uh, with these exemptions. What was supposed to be something that was just a small right and a quick and easy way to get small amounts of water is now being exploited. And it is having an impact on our water resources and our senior water users and our landscapes. And it's time that we need to really think about how do we fix that? So I was going to address the question in the chat about any system that is um, using 
35 gallons a minute is, is your flow rate, but it's more about your total volume, the 10 acre feet. Um, that is what's generally on your water right. If you are trying to, <clears throat> if you are using more than 10 acre feet, yes, you need to have a water right for that, but it is nearly impossible to do that in a closed basin because they're not really giving out more water rights without a very in-depth um, analysis and proof that you are not impacting any other water users. So <clears throat> that's the conundrum. They can't, developers can't really get a small system water right right now um, in our closed basins. And so they have to go to the individual exempt wells. Um, Ken, I see that you just put the New York Times article in there. Uh, New York Times has been doing a whole bunch of articles on um, water and aquifer depletions. There's a whole series and the latest one uh, does feature that story about the uh, subdivision in Broadwater County and what's going on there. The same case that Kim just referred to. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so you can't develop in a closed basin, right? So closed basins, what I didn't tell you, and I we do have a map and you can go to the DNRC website, um, but basically the entire upper Missouri is closed. So that means um, Beaverhead, Madison, Gallatin, Lewis and Clark counties, basically all the way to Great Falls, um, the upper Clark Fork, and... Um, uh, then there are some other closures that are groundwater and sort of smaller, smaller things as well. Um, so saying that we can't develop there um, is a little bit of a problem. <laughs> I think we think we might have a fight on our hands. <clears throat> um, you guys can go ahead. Do you want to, Randy, you want to come off uh, mute? And ask that question. Sorry, I'm in a public library, so I'm going to keep my voice down. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, it, it in terms of legislative fixes, it would just seem like, given political trends, that it just seems highly unlikely that there will be a legislative fix, and that the legislature is more likely to make the situation even worse. Is that a fair thing to say? I, um, I, I would agree. Well, I would partially agree with you. And I think that the, in, since, since I've been at the Clark Four coalition and, um, spending time in Helena during the legislative session, uh, 2017, we saw a bad exempt well bill 2019. We saw another one, saw it in 2021, saw it again, 2023, um, but I think those efforts have all largely been driven by the same interests. And so I think at least there's, I have a, a glimmer of hope right now, because what we saw last legislative session was really, I thought, a, a very strong uh, response to a bad exempt well proposal that would have made the situation worse. Um, I was really surprised by um, the response. It was House Bill 642. Um, it really, um, it, there was like a, 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 a very, very visceral response from the agricultural community in Montana, um, the senior water rights users, um, a whole bunch of folks kind of joined the, the League of Cities and Towns, um, conservation interests, everybody was kind of united. And I feel like that momentum has carried on somewhat um, to the interim now that there's a a working group kind of trying to tackle this issue head on. Um, but um, as we all know, it, once you come up with a policy proposal and it, it's introduced in Helena, anything can happen. And your your good idea can become a terrible idea. They can amend the bill. They can, uh, I mean, it could it could die right away. I mean, it's, yeah, there's, there's you can't count on anything there. Um, so that's why I think that it's, uh, it's important to at least recognize um, the alternative options um, should should that occur. So yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And I would add, I mean, I think we're hoping that that stakeholder working group um, is really kind of working through. This is one of the topics that they're working on, and 
really trying to figure out, you know, get their arms wrapped around it. And, and hopefully that, that carries forth um, into the legislature with some policy recommendations, but who knows what will happen. It's hard to say. Um, Danny, you brought up Senate Bill 382, which was uh, the Land Use Planning Act that did pass. Uh, and that bill would have been really helpful for counties uh, if counties had been forced to adhere to that because it would have required a look at, you know, sort of a comprehensive view of water resources before um, subdivisions were approved. But since counties opted out of it, it's now primarily focused on the cities. But we're hoping that some of the counties will begin to think about using that or implementing parts of 382. <clears throat> yeah, not zoning, not zoning for 382, but, but thinking about, I mean, ideally, if we were really planning ahead of time and we had some vision, we would, we would begin to think about where do we want to not build and then do everything we can to you know, focus building in places that are more appropriate and really consider the water and protect those people that are gonna be building their homes in places where they think they're gonna have water, but it, um, you know, who knows for how long, especially given climate change. That's the one thing I haven't, I meant to mention that. I mean, climate change is, is real. We have more people coming. We are gonna have less water available and more demands, and we really need to be creative and thinking proactively about how and where we build. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> Do we have other questions? Anybody else? I apologize if we were, It's this is a difficult topic and um, it's for water wonks. Thank you for those of you who stuck with us, um, who are interested in this. Um, happy to chat more about it later and um, send us questions. Katie had the reach out with both of our emails, um, but uh, you know we'd love to really think more about what's going on. Andrew, did you want to give any other pitch on the on stakeholder working group? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess just uh, to echo what what Ann said, reach out um, if if you have any questions. Happy to always happy to chat about this issue um, and try to give a, a response to any questions. But um, also, yeah, the, the, the DNRC's working group is meeting um, a couple times a month um, for the entire interim. They've, they've already started meeting last, uh, last summer and I, I am a member of this working group uh, sort of generally representing conservation interests. And so I'm doing my best to to um, try to represent, you know, our, our constituents at the Clark Fork Coalition and and others as well. Uh, but there is, you know, there this is supposed to be a public process. There is opportunity occasionally for public comment, and I think that's going to be, you know, the timing of that is going to be critical when we get down to the nitty gritty and actually come up with policy proposals to to deal with this exempt well problem. Um, you know, I. I, I can't say right now how it's going to what it's going to look like, um, but I'm hoping it's going to be a, a good, a good common sense way um, to address this issue. And at that time, it would be great to have the public support um, for that proposal. Um, and then, of course, once it crosses um, beyond the outside of the working group and into the hands of the legislature, um, the the public com um, comment. Uh, opportunities are going to be yeah, even more important at that at that stage. So, yeah, uh, yeah, stay in, stay tuned. Yeah, we'll use our um, our resources when there's an opportunity when something has actually been developed to let you guys know or send that out and uh, ways that you can participate or comment <clears throat> on anything that comes up. But I'm staying. I'm not a member of the committee, but I'm paying uh, pretty close attention and attending as an active member of the public. There we go. And Robert, are you being cynical? Robert Ray? <laughs> he says, it's not likely. <clears throat> they might, although, you know, it's job security. We've been working on it for a very long time. 
hopefully we can make some changes soon. Anything else? Parting words of wisdom? Uh, we had a, oh, go ahead, Hannah. Um, I just had a question that, so in between now and when possible legislation will come up and there are proposed subdivisions in our communities, is the best way to engage our county commissioners or, you know, highlight to in our in local papers that, you know, the people buying this don't have an actual water, right? <laughs> That's a great, a great comment, Hannah. I mean, you, I think going, paying attention as subdivisions are coming in or being proposed and going to planning board meetings or to the commissioner hearings on them um, is great and providing some public comment. But I also think letters to the editor and letting people know that like, this is really, because I, I worry that people don't really understand this, that you know, there's no guarantee um, that there is going to be water. The problem with going to the commissioners or the planning board is that because it's not identified in the Montana Subdivision and Platting Act, um, there isn't really any recourse or it's very difficult for um, the developer or for the planning board and commissioners to deny the subdivision because they just kick it to DNRC and they say, well, it's not our purview DNRC will make the decision. Um, so it's this catch-22, everybody's sort of pointing different directions. Um, but I think the public, and that's part of this webinar, is getting the public to really begin to understand this uh, without getting too deep into the weeds on water rights, but realizing how this is working and what people are missing out. <clears throat> I would add to that too, um, if, you know, there there are um, development subdivision proposals, you know, like the one in Broadwater County that um, that uh, it was it sort of reached that level where there was some some legal recourse. Um, there's one that that I'm tracking right now in the Bitterroot that's sort of a similar situation. And it, I think um, the key there is um, to to find folks who have existing water rights. Um, who could be impacted by this because they have a foot in the door to kind of elevate this issue or this problem um, and potentially um, get get it in front of the DNRC or or even a court um, if it gets to that that point. But yeah, um, pay attention to or talk to to neighbors or, or people who live in the area who have water rights, whether it's a well. Or um, or a surface water right for a stream or or whatever. I mean, they're going to be senior to this proposal. Um, they should be. So um, I think that that gives them um, at least the ability to insert themselves in the process. Good question. And then Danny answered you in the chat as well. Anybody else from MEIC want to add anything? Team. Okay. I was I was just gonna say that we're recording this and it'll be up on our YouTube and our website tomorrow. So you can refer back to the, the wisdom contained here. And I saw Anne come off of mute. So I'm gonna give her gonna say thank you. I thought that was terrific. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining us, you guys. Have a good night. <laughs>